I think we have a rather intriguing subject this morning. And I think to understand it, we have to take a general survey of the attitudes of ancient peoples regarding the future. One of the earliest records that we have of the prophetic spirit is an inscription on the basis or base of a statue of the god Nebo of Babylon, probably dated somewhere about 2000 B.C. And the god says, That which has been will be. I am Nebo, the lord of the writing table. Therefore, the entire concept of antiquity was that prophecy was based not upon calculations of starry portents or the consulting of more common and ordinary oracles. It was based upon the inevitable sequences of cause and effect. Whatever has been will come again if the cause comes again. And the, or the prediction will not be dated in terms of years, but in terms of human relationships, the patterns that are set up in the various complexes of mortal society. The Great War, the last war, has occurred as a symbol in a great many different religions. It is recorded, of course, in the Bible. And probably the word Armageddon is derived from an early Palestinian term. It was the war in which the kings of the earth would make war against the hosts of heaven. And ultimately, the kings of the earth would be utterly discomforted. Perhaps the form of the story also borrows from Egypt, where it is tied closely into the myth of the dying god Osiris. Osiris, who was the principal deity of the later Egyptian recension, was foully slain by his own brother, who usurped his kingdom. After the death of Osiris, Isis, his wife, posthumously brought forth a child, Horus, the avenger of his father. Horus, the golden hawk, was the symbol of the resurrection of Osiris himself, who was said to have been reborn in his own son. And in the end, Horus led the hosts of light their Shesti, the golden hawks, against the power and tyranny of Typhon. And there was a last great battle, and in this battle Typhon was overcome and chained forever in the pits beneath the earth. This last great war also arises in the Hindu tradition, and the two great epics of India, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. Both are concerned with a great symbolic conflict. In the Mahabharata is concealed the magnificent lines of the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord's Song, in which the victory of life over death, of virtue and integrity over corruption, this victory is clearly set forth. In the Ramayana we have another great battle, more in an epic form, and somewhat reminiscent of the Odyssey and Iliad of Homer. But it was a great battle of evil against righteousness, and righteousness prevailed. Then you remember in the Nordic <coughs> rites, the last battle on the plain of Ragnarok. It was here that the gods from high, uh, high Asgard, the Nordic Olympus, gathered on the plain to have that last final conflict with the powers of evil. 
and the battle was a terrible one, and good and bad perished together, and the earth was desolated. But one couple escaped into a high mountain, and from them came forth a new race to replenish the earth. The war that is to end war is constantly referred to in different levels of human society. Primitive tribal beliefs, highly sophisticated epics deal with this subject. So it is interesting to try to understand, perhaps, how this concept developed until it has become an enduring belief. A belief that has about it the strange circumstance that generation after generation has identified this last war with the conflicts of their own times. Wherever a great emergency has arisen, it was believed or speculated that perhaps this was the Armageddon. And because the date was never given, there was no way of confirming it. I think, however, that if we study the subject in the spirit of the Sibylline prophecies and the great prophetic books of the Bible, Isaiah and Revelation, and perhaps the Chaldean oracles of the Zoroasters, we will come to a little different point of view as to the meaning of this magnificent, elusive prophecy. I think we will discover that it traces back perhaps to an intuitive quality within man himself. I think the human being in the depth of his own nature is a prophet. Down beneath the surfaces of his hopes and fears, his glamours and his attitudes, there is a strange deep pathos the same type of thing that we find in the great ring opera of Wagner, the great symbolism of something that is going to pass away because it has not within it the integrity of its own survival. The uh, Sibylline prophecies have to do with not a date or a time, but a sequence of events. And every sequence of events comes finally to some kind of an Armageddon. Every form of history does this. Every religion has passed through this. Every science is born and dies because of the weaknesses within its own nature. And this sequence of weaknesses, this conflict between principle and ambition, probably lies at the very root of man's enduring belief that in the end virtue will be supreme. We see this very much about us today. We see it in the lives of individuals and in the motions of states. And probably in the last 2,000 years we have seen strange fulfillments of warnings. We remember the admonition that those who live by the sword will perish by the sword. And this has happened many times in history. It is a prophecy that is forever fulfilling itself, not once, but many times. We recognize this tragedy of human ambition, and that it exists because of human ambition. We read of Alexander the Great, dead at 30 under the walls of Babylon. Caesar, assassinated at the foot of Pompey's column. We see Napoleon, dying of cancer on the island of St. Helena. We see Hitler, committing suicide in a bunker in Berlin. We see Mussolini, hung from a lamppost in northern Italy. The path of glory leads but to the grave. Therefore, there is some reason why these various mistakes that people make individually and collectively have a consequence which is unavoidable. 
We are told in the Bible that cause and effect follow each other. We are told that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. Buddha puts it in slightly different words when he says, Effects follow their causes, as the wheel of the cart follows the foot of the oxen. Therefore, wherever there is a causation of catastrophe, and that causation is not transmuted, then evil is not corrected, then in the due course of time the catastrophe comes. It is unavoidable. And down inside of ourselves we know this, but we do not want to admit it. Each individual wants to be an exception to the law of cause and effect, but no one is an exception. And unless the individual builds his life upon integrities, he is going to inevitably come into conflict with law. Not man-made law necessarily, but the law governing life itself. For there are principles in the universe which cannot be violated. And I think the whole story of the Armageddon represents the climax of any type of sequence of events in which evil predominates. We find it in our personal lives. We find it in the story of the alcoholic. He feels that he is going to be an exception. Yet if he continues and does not correct his faults, he will die of his own shortcoming. The narcotics addict is in the same condition. There is no way of winning against the common laws of truth and reality which supervise and control all things. Even in business and politics and all the different professions, we are seeing today a great deal of harvesting. We are seeing every day how mistakes have been allowed to pile up, how individuals have placed their own advantage above the common good and as a result have brought the common good and themselves down into ruin. We are aware that constantly that which is not true comes into conflict with the inevitable patterns of reality which cannot be violated. Every effort we make to transgress ends only in a disaster for ourselves. Now this being the case, and most individuals having at least down somewhere in their natures at least a, an intimation that this is true, there comes always the problem that philosophy, culture, ethics, all these subjects have dealt with, that as the individual discovers that the integrities within himself are weakening, it is then time for him to make a strong resolution to correct his own fault. In every sequence of disasters there is a moment when prudence, strength, courage, or integrity could transmute the evil. In every sequence of problems, there is a point at which personal integrity could solve the problem. If this is not available, if the individual does not rise to this occasion and permits the kings of this world to gain ascendancy over his life, he will then come face to face with the ultimate conflict. So it is very important, it seems, for each individual to regard the Armageddon as tied directly to himself. We are not the victims of history. We are not the victims of the earth's imperfections. We are the victims of our own mistakes. It is not heaven that brings down a nation. It is the works of humanity misunderstood works, corrupted works, that will bring down the greatest nation the world can produce. It is all in the last analysis 
a problem of man's own development of integrities. Well, he drifts along with a few virtues which he is trying to live. He is hoping definitely that the heaven will forgive him for his shortcomings. There is no evidence that heaven even judged them, him for them. The judgment comes from himself. He knows his own shortcomings, whether he admits them or not. He may conceal them from others and hide them from his own conscience, but he knows he has them. And this type of thing produces in life after life a personal Armageddon in which the individual must face up to his own integrities or suffer the consequences. Dissipation has its price. Corruption has its price. And most of all, self-centeredness has its price. Practically every tragedy in history has been born of human selfishness. Individuals have desired and determined to use the skills that have been given to them in a ruthless competition against their fellow human beings. We have placed profit above integrity. We have placed uh, the struggle of competition as an inevitable truth and cooperation as a dim idealistic uncertainty. As a result of that, we have created in each department where we have compromised principles the beginnings of a story that will end in an Armageddon. In every case, we finally come face to face with the facts. We either meet them or fail. If we meet them, we have achieved the purpose of life, which is victory over weakness. If we fail to meet them, then as far as this life is concerned, we have failed regardless of how much wealth, fame, or authority we have accumulated through the corruption of principles. Now we look around and we find the world in a condition in which a number of preachers and evangelists are talking about the Armageddon. It looks like it's here again. I think this is a mistake. It is here still. <laughs> it is here because it has never been met. It was here in the first time when a caveman threw a rock at another caveman. This was the beginning of war. And it will continue as long as the individual inside of himself wants to throw a rock. He may dress the rock up in a nuclear weapon, but it is still the old rock going on doing its original mischief. It is not the fact that at one time, somewhere, in a datable future, we are going to see the heavens open and the archangelic host come down and cleanse the earth. This is not what we are confronted with. We are confronted with the fact that in the due course of every civilization, every person's life, every invention, art, science, craft, trade, there are rules. And if these rules are broken, universal law, which is always here, steps in and balances the books. When this happens, a lot of misery seemingly occurs. Individuals are frustrated in all their ambitions and all their uh, prides. But it is either that they shall have that bad moment and then gradually come back to integrity, or they will destroy everything that they have hoped to gain. Now, we are in the very edge of a very difficult international world situation. We are in the presence of an accumulation of thousands of years of mistaken activity. Now, in most people's minds, the worst mistakes have been the most pleasant occurrences. The individual has found that it is possible for him to have more money than his neighbor. It is possible for him to be elected to public office and have quite a following. It is possible for him to be a lawmaker and make many laws that are especially beneficial to himself. He has all kinds of opportunities. 
And we see around us a world of trade, of barter, exchange, of investment, of speculation, a world of individuals all working desperately for their own benefit. Now this is regarded as virtuous. Why shouldn't we go out and work for our own benefit? Why should we give any consideration to anybody else? Why should we put someone else's good whom we don't even know above our own opportunity to do unusually well? The answer is that we are part of a collective. And the moment we begin to corrupt our neighbors, the moment we begin to exploit each other, each man exploits himself, but he doesn't know it. He is gradually building for the complete destruction of the system he has abused. And somewhere along the line, there will always be what has been produced by nature over thousands of years. There will be prophets. There will be someone arise who sees the facts, who tries to do something about it. Perhaps he is accepted, more likely he is rejected because he interferes with the personal privileges of the individual. Some cases he has been martyred, in many cases he has been ridiculed. But always along the way, there comes a moment or a time in which the facts are available and the individual can learn. This is his big decision, whether he is big enough wise enough and virtuous enough to sacrifice something of his own ambitions to accomplish the preservation of the society to which he belongs. If he does not have this desire, he will then drift with it until it all falls apart together. For the problems that destroy society are the injustices allowed to linger within the nature of the human being himself. As long as they are there, trouble will continue. Another field where Armageddon shows up quite repeatedly is in domestic relationships. Young people starting out in marriage are filled with hopes and filled with aspirations. They think they're going to be able to make a wonderful life. But very few sit down for a moment even before this fatal step is taken to determine what they are really thinking what they really believe, what they actually want. Do they really want to build a strong relationship? Or do they want to unite for some type of personal profit? Are they out for something they want to take rather than what they want to give? Are they more inclined to be self-centered? Do their own ambitions transcend the family good? Do they neglect each other or their children in the search of privileges for their own pleasure? If so, they are building up an Armageddon. There'll come a time, and perhaps they'll settle down and have a long heart-to-heart -heart talk about it. If something good comes out of that, perhaps the home is preserved. On the other hand, if in this discussion each individual remains set in his ways and determined to have his own way at the cost of all else, then the war breaks out. Then the kings of the earth go to war against the hosts of heaven. For the integrities of life are heaven bestowed, and the inequities come from the hosts of earth. So everywhere we go, anywhere we turn, we will find that there are opportunities to arbitrate the great conflict. Perhaps we can't arbitrate it indefinitely or completely, but if we try, we can always lift a great deal of the burden. We can correct some faults that are possible for us to correct, and in that way add further vitality and endurance to our civilization and our way of life. So in this problem, the problem that has annoyed, worried, or bestirred of many people for a long, long time, is that what is to happen? And we are told that after the Armageddon, or after the loss of the war of Kurukshetra, after the Golden Hawk has won against the hosts of Typhon, there comes the new heaven and the new earth. 
Now, this can happen in the individual also. A lot of uh, theologians feel that if an individual turns from a very secular type of life and accepts spiritual instruction and rededicates his career to the service of principles, that he is born again, that he has created inside of himself a new heaven and a new earth, that he has found the strength of peace and integrity and charity and kindness. If these transformations take place within the person, uh, then truly we are facing inside of ourselves the millennium. Uh, the uh, old prophets also carried the idea that after the last great war, there would be a new heaven and a new earth, not only within us, but within the great world environment in which we live. If the selfishness is taken out of ourselves, the corruption of our natural resources is prevented. If we build our lives upon principles, then we will fail to destroy the planet on which we live. And if we are truly intelligent and wise and thoughtful, then comes the paraclete, or the Prince of Peace, then comes a new law and a new cycle of existence, and we shall follow the way of heaven instead of the way of earth. And if we follow the way of heaven, we will be blessed by the virtues and integrities within ourselves. But there is no possible way in which we can pile up a defense of vices which will protect us in an emergency. No matter what we do, unless we change the basic principle of life, making integrity the final criterion of all things, until then we are in danger. We endanger not because heaven wishes to destroy us, but because we choose to destroy ourselves. So we are all concerned now quite a bit, and we wonder what is going to happen. Are we going to be able to handle this difficulty? Again, we can look about us and see what is happening. We observe all kinds of emergencies arising, and we find, we might almost say, the last desperate stand of that which must inevitably fail. We are witnessing a condition in which, unless there is a major change of integrities, we are not going to be able to solve the problem. We are never going to be able, in military way, to bring peace to the earth. We will never be able, in the exploitation of resources, to attain security. We can never buy our way to peace any more than the Roman Empire could buy its way to peace. All these things have been tried before. We can never control so much that what we control cannot revolt against us. There is only one possibility to the solution of all difficulties, and that is that all the nations and all the beliefs claiming the same thing shall obey their own claim, namely, uh, that there is a fundamental integrity as stated by religion, as supported by philosophy, and as being gradually discovered by science. And if this is not used, uh, then most of our hopes are in vain. On the other hand, there is something else that we have to recognize, namely, that if in our own hearts and minds we make the necessary adjustments, it may well be that just because we are little people, without very much authority or power, that we are not going to be able to change the course of history. As individuals, we cannot. It is only as groups that we can have a powerful influence. The more persons who see the facts, the safer the world will become. But in that transitional period in which perhaps we believe we have seen some facts, and we worry and are gravely concerned because of the conditions around us, then I think it is very nef definitely necessary to realize that the law of cause and effect 
which is producing these circumstances, is not a law of extermination. It is not a law in which the end of universal process is annihilation. It is a law in which, in the long and greater span of things, it is necessary to prevent corruption from gaining too strong a hold upon the world. It is part of a plan that says, when you make a mistake, you are punished. And as a result of a few punishments, you learn not to make the mistake. You may hold out for quite a while, but in the end, the punishments which come as the result of wrong living will discourage the mistakes. They will not go on. Man will not exterminate himself. Man will not destroy himself, because he can make himself massively uncomfortable. He can get into more scrapes and problems than he ever wants to face. But there is within the human spirit itself an incorruptible, which is going to fight on until it wins. But it has to win in the service of truth. It cannot win in any other way. Many nations of the past have failed and faded away from us. And each of these nations more or less perished as the result of an Armageddon. It was this type of internal corruption that destroyed the Grecian states, destroyed Egypt, brought down Asia in ruin, and destroyed very largely the whole cultural system of the Mediterranean and Western Europe. The, the conditions follow that pattern. Nations have faded away. Whole processes of hope have vanished. And yet humanity has gone on. Humanity is a strangely wonderful, vital thing. It is something that continues and goes on, but leaves behind the ruins of its own mistakes. Now, it's always hoped that the individual will not be forced again to go through so strenuous and perhaps so painful a process of regeneration. The uh, old Rosicrucians referred to the universal reformation, the conscious creation of the army of the Golden Hawk. In the case of the uh, Nordic rites, uh, Odin and the aces of Mount uh, Asgard gathered together the heroes from the battlefields of life. They gathered up all of those who died in the defense of good causes. And the Valkyrie carried these heroes to the eternal feasting of the gods. And from them was formed the last army that was to protect heaven against the ravages of the underworld. In the Egyptian story, uh, the Golden Hawk, they were the enlightened ones. They were the ones who saw the truth. They were the soldiers of the cross. They were the ones who fought not with guns or swords and spears, but fought with truth, with integrity, with the armament of wisdom, of patience and forgiveness. And this army of the Golden Hawk represents that ever-increasing group of human beings who begin to understand, who are no longer completely dominated by the corruptions of their time. And we see this army forming everywhere, even now. In one nation, uh, there is a great move toward peace. In another nation, there are reforms in the living conditions. In another nation, we have a liberalization of education. In still other areas, different religions are getting together. But where they do not get together, then we have the making of an Armageddon. We have a making of a great struggle based upon an intolerance. Where tolerance exists, there is a new army of light to help causes out. Then we find movements, organizations everywhere seeking justice, seeking integrity. We have a great revival of religion in many parts of the world as a first defense, because after all, the army of the hawk 
or the army of the light must be spiritually integrated, spiritually inspired. It must not expect God to be on its side, but it must be on the side of God. And in these ded dedications and reconsecrations, thousands, millions of young people who grew up in a generation of atheism and agnosticism are beginning to recognize the tremendous need for spiritual integrities. And gradually this change in human nature is going to result in the development of the protecting army. The army of the light is also being formed. And somewhere along the line, the army of the light must face the army of darkness. And if the light is sincere and honest, then the darkness will be overcome. No corruption can withstand the strength of direct and honorable virtue. So that we are watching as this problem is producing its own panacea. There will be an alignment somewhere along the way in which the forces that believe in truth must come head on into confusion or into collision with the forces who deny the existence of any truth except self-gratification. This may come but on the other hand, it may simmer down into nothing more or less than a gradual change of point of view. Because millions of people, as soon as they realize that they have support, will turn toward righteousness and turn toward truth because it is happier, it is more pleasant, more protective of all the values and virtues with which we are concerned. The fact that young people are beginning to need religion and find it. That many, many people are rebelling against corruption in every walk of life means that in time these rebellions will cement into a new point of view. And if this new point of view comes, the war has not, well, may not be a head-on collision at all, but a gradual shift of perspective with a few adjustments and a few people with headaches, but the majority of individuals rejoicing in a better state of things. It is amazing that the human being should be satisfied to be miserable. It, it is hard to understand how we are willing to do so many unpleasant things and gain out of it nothing but further unpleasantness. Why does it happen that we nurse grievances fully aware that the more we nurse them, the more we will grieve? Why not get over the grievance in the first place? Why should we spend a life nursing hatreds? Why should we look back and remember every unhappy thing that has been done to us and completely forget any unhappy things we did to other people? Why do we have these habits? Well, it seems to be that the reason we have them is because they are part of a common heritage of ignorance to which we are all indebted. An inheritance of it's always been that way, therefore it always will be. My ancestors didn't like each other, why should I? We don't realize that when we look back on our ancestors that they died of their dislikes. And that in, with these dislikes they created wars and crimes and overcame good things impoverished themselves and their families, and yet we keep right on doing it. There is, however, nature stepping in. Nature knows uh, that there is a potential for solution inside of the human being. That down at the very depths of ourselves, we are honorable. That regardless of all the incrustations of errors that surface us, the depths are honest. Because at the very root and source and depth of ourselves is the divine principle by which we exist. The spirit in us, the divine power in us, is uncorrupted. But it is bound and burdened. It is imprisoned within an, a pattern of attitudes, a way of selfishness, and an endless determination to gratify our superficial desires. We have just refused to permit the best part of ourselves to come through. 
This probably is one of the interesting aspects of Zen Buddhism and some of the Oriental philosophies that we are just beginning to appreciate. Nearly all of them are based upon one basic principle. Be still and know that I am God. In quiet meditation, in relaxation away from worldly possessions, detachments from, from false ambitions, the individual finally can reach communion with himself. He can find the reason for his own existence if he will be quiet, if he will release and relax, and will get away for a while from the tremendous pressures of temporality. If he will get over the idea that he has to have a bigger house or that he needs another swimming pool or that his car is an antique because it's six months old, he will have a little time for something else. And uh, difficulties arising now are cutting desperately into the profit theory that most people have lived by. We are beginning to find that it's getting tighter. And regardless how we feel, we must partly blame ourselves for the existing conditions. We have spoiled ourselves. Now we are suffering from the results of this spoilage. So with a little quietude, a little integrity, the individual will begin to simplify life. And as he does this, he gradually separates himself from the factors that would involve him in the strenuous revolution of an Armageddon. The individual who is willing to begin the orientation of himself and begins to put value where it belongs uh, will find that it is true that thousands can fall on the right hand and thousands on the left, but the just man shall not be moved. As be, when we begin to understand the reason for things, we are not going to be constantly agitate and de ag agitated and distressed because some of our luxuries are impaired. We are going to realize that the whole program of nature is to get man back on the path, get him going in the direction he should be going, the direction that leads ultimately to peace and security for himself and his world. Now, in the old Sibylline days, uh, these prophetesses uh, are said to have been members of a kind of secret organization, and that these prophetesses all predicted that in the fullness of time a Redeemer would come, that at the proper moment a new king would arise after the Armageddon, and the world should be ruled by a divine power. that all of the selfishness of things will pass away. One of the uh, prophecies of the symbols was that gold and silver shall lose their guile. All the things that have tempted man away from his own integrities will of themselves cease, because they are only there because men support them, because they believe in them, and because they want to perpetuate them. Now, the question always arises in the minds of a great many people as to how we can live if we didn't have all this pressure. If we would settle down to the quiet ways of life, could we survive? Is it possible under the present situation to take care of the perpetuation of the species without this endless conflict and this endless disparity of opportunity? Well, there's a question there, and maybe it's a question that must be faced someday. But there is a point which we can face, a degree of it, in which we can come to the certainty that the essentials of life are available if we know how to use them and if we use them without exploitation. This tremendous overculture, this overpowering economic structure is not justified by nature. It is not part of an original plan for things. It has been built up uh, like the patches on the coat of many colors, simply because every mistake led to some kind of a new legislation, and this in turn led to others to ultimate confusion. 
the problem of why are we here must finally come into focus. Are we here simply to keep on grubbing along until we use up everything we have? Are we here until it becomes necessary for us to try to fly off to some other planet which may or may not be inhabitable? Is it necessary for us to keep on uh, polluting the atmosphere, polluting the water, and destroying endangered species until nothing is left? This uh, is a rather dismal prospect, but a lot of people are acting as though this was the inevitable end and that there's no way of avoiding it. There are many ways of avoiding it. One of the ways to avoid it is to begin to examine ourselves in another and more critical sense of the word. What have we got inside of ourselves which is more important than what we are trying to do outside of ourselves? Those who have given much thought and study and meditation to this problem realize that the great unexplored territory at the present time is the inner life of man himself. We have no understanding whatever of the potential of the human being. We are quite convinced that he is an, a very animated and sapient biped who wanders about making trouble for himself and other people. We are convinced that if he adds up a billion dollars that he has fulfilled his own potential, even though he loses it the next day. But we have never really explored the human being to find out what he is good for. We do not know what raw material is locked within him. We are doing everything we can to change the world, but giving very little thought to the unfoldment of the natural resources of man himself. What would he have to do or be in order to be happy? What would be necessary in order for him to be safe? for himself and others. What is the end that would more than justify the sacrifice of a lot of uh, castles in sand piles? What would be in man that would be worth more to him, to everyone else, and to his own happiness and security than $10 million in the bank? Well, man is a potential masterpiece. Uh, but for one reason or another, he has deformed the sculpturing himself. He is no longer giving attention to the possibilities of his own nature. The solution to his problems are not necessarily in the pushing of his present procedures beyond a reasonable limit. What would we feel, how would we feel, if, for instance, in a little period few thousand years at most, maybe less, we began to develop the extrasensory band within the human being. Supposing in the course of time we reach a point in which inwardly we have sensory perceptions that would enable us to judge and estimate practically everything in nature. How would it be if, for instance, we came to a point where there could be in this world no such a thing as a secret. Supposing that we can read everybody's mind. And, of course, everyone is reading ours at the same time. Supposing there'd be no need uh, for concealment and no possibility of it. Well, in our present situation, this would practically result in universal bankruptcy. <laughs> We can't trust ourselves, and we have greater distrust of others. Supposing our politicians could never hide anything from us. <laughs> supposing our lawyers couldn't. And supposing we had an understanding of our own lives and our own bodies to the positions, to the degree that a physician could not make a mistake. And supposing all of this costs nothing, because we are born with it. All right, suppose in the same length of time we, and under the same conditions we reorganize our theory of nutrition. Perhaps our nutritional theory isn't just exactly right. Perhaps the greater part of our nutrition should not come from the earth, but from light, 
from the, from the power of energies in space. Supposing the individual could survive indefinitely by developing the, the abilities of his own magnetic field. Supposing he could travel by teleportation. Perhaps every faculty and power that has been fictionally used in magic is natural and possible to him with a complete regeneration of his motivations. Perhaps then he could realize that the moment he is selfish, this entire world of beauty begins to collapse around him. While he is unselfish, it is there. Freed from a great many things, he doesn't have to be lazy. Today, if we get a little money or something of that nature, we sit down in front of a television set and spend the rest of our time wasting it. Supposing instead of that, this new perspective on things gave us an entirely different orientation to what life was about. That we have countless ways of gaining greater insights, exploring, discovering, enjoying, recognizing the common friendships and kinships of life, and that in a gentle and friendly way we could live with each other. Perhaps under a few of those circumstances we might observe that the need for constant policing and countless legislative protection might greatly diminish. We wouldn't need it. The individual would not need the protection that is necessary because he is not honorable in his relationships. Albert Hubbard years ago made a rather interesting statement on business. He said, every individual is now receiving a salary five times what, he, what it seems to be. If he's getting $50 a week, which was a big money in those days, it is because he is entitled to 500 and his real salary is 500 But he has to deduct that from that, the $450 that other people have to spend to take care of him and make sure he knows what he's doing. Supposing we had these skills and abilities. Suppose also we had a new religious concept that we realize fully and clearly from inward experience, the inward source of all faith, that we beheld more or less the heavens opening and the divine plan unfolding before us. That no longer we had to believe in anything we knew we also would learn to know in that time how to protect life, how to prolong it. We would learn how to normalize populations. We would know how to combat aging processes. We would also realize that without perversion and corruption, the resources of the earth would survive and carry a, great, uh, a much greater population than we have today. It is selfishness that is destroying the power of the earth to provide us with what we need. So if this new time came in which we did things right, where we had time for music and art, where we had time for friendship and time to unfold the tremendous creativities within ourselves, that in each one of us is the artist, each of us can be the mathematician to explore the universe. Each one of us can be the psychology to investigate the inner structure of our own souls. With these possibilities, a great part of the corruptions of life would be overcome. And we could possibly move into a new way of life, a new heaven and a new earth, a universal reformation, in which out of the sorrow, sickness, and weariness of our own mistakes, we are beginning to see the end that we should know and understand and work with every day. Now we are also concerned, as this Armageddon problem grows stronger in our minds, we are more and more concerned with finding ways to pinpoint it. That actually each person must realize that the Armageddon in his own life is more or less the result of the opposite forces locked in conflict. There is an old saying that the prophet, when he would do good, evil was ever nigh unto him. 
And this is the problem with the individual. He is constantly torn between his charities and his selfishness. He is constantly torn between serving others and protecting self-interest. His ambitions lure him away, not only from the natural joys of life, but also undermine his health and surround him with ambitious followings who are ready to destroy him any minute for their own gain. How are we going to meet this problem that is in our lives every day? That hardly a day goes by when we pick up a telephone or anything else when there isn't a little conflict of some kind introduced into our way of life. If we are therefore allowed to sit down for a moment, we estimate our problem, and then we're likely to say to ourselves, well, I'll do the best I can, which means we will do what is most profitable at the moment. Principles are ignored. We just do not have the courage to challenge security. We are afraid that we will destroy some advantage of our own. We do not want to risk our job. We do not wish to alienate our friends. We do not wish to damage our reputations uh, through integrities in an environment where they do not exist. Yet with all this type of thing, this fear, we are punishing ourselves every day and we can always go back to some very simple rules and principles that we can use without necessarily annoying anyone else. In fact, the average individual under the present condition of his life is one of the greatest annoyers that has ever been created. We can annoy everyone, including ourselves. But supposing instead of trying to do this, we begin to see if we can't fight out these little Armageddons each day, that we will put the strength of our integrity against the pressure of corrupted circumstances, that we will begin by disciplining ourselves to the degree uh, that we can put off or deny some of the pressure temptations that arise within our own minds. If we can say to ourselves occasionally, I think it would be best if I do this, but I must give up that, that perhaps there are times when we should give up that. We do not have to form these policies that are unchangeable in their corruption. A man was talking, a psychiatrist was talking to a patient and said to this particular patient, you should try to be more patient with your family. And the man just looked him straight in the eyes and said, I can't do it. It's impossible. Well, to most people, anything that interferes with habit is virtually impossible. They cannot go against the patterns that they have built up. Disposition takes over. The ancient policies reaffirm themselves, and we are subject not only to the ancient policies of our own generation, but of other generations that have preceded us. We simply are unable to do that which we do not want to do. We can think of a thousand excuses. And when it comes to a head-on collision, we just set the jaw and do that which we intended to do, whether it is right or wrong. Now this is something we can begin to overcome. Because when we take this attitude, we then become the kings of the world and we are declaring war on the hierarchies of heaven. In a small way, we declare war on truth every time we choose to do wrong. Now, it doesn't look like it amounts to much. Who cares whether we make this little mistake or that little mistake? But in the long run, this, this mistake and that mistake all combine to make a great mistake, and that is ourselves. We are not able to control ourselves. Our habits have taken over. World habits have taken over. The corruptions of 50 generations are dominating the present generation. 
and the mistakes of 50 or 60 years of personal living dominate millions of people today. They cannot change. They cannot get over their intolerances, their bigotries, their inconsistencies. And, of course, every negative attitude is a health destroyer. It begins to corrupt circulation. It destroys the body, tears down the emotions, and afflicts the mind. Little by little, these small mistakes, these wrong attitudes, coming together, come to the final termination of bringing us down in a defeat. We have lost the Armageddon. The battle is lost. And there is nothing that then remains except for us to retire from the stage and maybe in a future embodiment do better. We are not gaining the results that we are entitled to. Now, it may well be that the average individual isn't strong enough to make a universal reformation of himself on any given day, but he can work on it. One way he can work on it is, if necessary, to write down a resolution. He can decide that something that he has always done that he knows isn't good for him, he's not going to do. Just one thing. If he has always been a procrastinator, he's going to do things on time, from now on. If he has always been a little bit of a bigot, he is going to study the things he hates and see whether he's right or not. And chances are he'll find he was wrong. There's a little old story about this old preacher who believed astrology was the work of the devil. And he preached against it every Sunday from the pulpit, loud and clear. Finally, someone said to him, you're saying the same thing all the time. If you're going to talk about this subject, why don't you get some new am ammunition? If you don't like it, find out more why you don't like it. So he crept into a couple of meetings of astrologers in London back in the old days uh, when they met uh, near Gray's Inn. And he listened at the back. He was looking for more information with which to downgrade the subject. After three or four meetings, he went back and changed his mind and said it was a lot better than he thought it was. <laughs> now, it's the same way with most bigotries. The individual, the perfect bigot, is the individual who is supremely ignorant. And the only way to get over it is to find out and to get rid of prejudices and to get rid of all these antagonisms. You can make a separate statement of jealousies, or extravagance, or waste, or deceit, or something that you were having a little trouble with. Put it down and stay with it. See, every time that the opportunity comes along to express this particular negative attitude, read the note and stay with your resolution to do it better. In a short time, you can make a game out of this, which is rather more interesting and certainly more profitable than bridge. And as a result of gradually making a game of self-improvement, you also have all the advantages of a delightful form of solitaire. You do not need anyone else to help you enjoy this. You can do it yourself. But gradually, as you get out of these pressures, you will find that you will be better adjusted socially, that you will have more friends, that you will have less worry, less confusion, and life will be far more pleasant and meaningful to you. But the problem is to get over that hurdle, to be able to break up this vicious determination to keep on doing it the same way, and being unable to take a chance. The always the fear that some way or other we will lose more by changing. But in the majority of cases, we're losing everything by not changing. There's also a great deal of help to be gained from moderate philosophical studies in these fields. If we really understand the t great teachings of the past or some of the better teachings of the present, we will find a great deal of ground for insights into the various problems that beset us. If we know that we have a major problem, we can take it up in terms of one of the philosophical systems that have worked with that problem. There is really no problem that can arise in human nature which has not been at some time pretty thoroughly ventilated. Long ago, maybe thousands of years ago, the answer to your problem was formulated, and it was a good answer. But the average person today has never even heard of the answer. 
so that it requires a little study, a little research in your chosen field of personal redemption to find out what you really need and how to get about it, what the solution is, why it is necessary, and why common sense can support you in making the necessary changes. In this way, you will gradually uh, re recruit your army, your army of good thoughts, your army of intelligent decisions, your army of clarified principles. And these are the army of the light that can protect you against the powers of darkness. And when the times of decision come, they are your defenders of the faith, which is very, very important. Another aspect of the situation that we, I think, should go into a little bit, perhaps, is the problem of children in connection with the needs of the moment. Young people are usually reasonably honest. They have to be well disciplined in dishonesty to do a perfect job of it. They would like to do right, most of them. They would like to hope a good life to bring and have their own families and raise them and have useful work and do it. The most young people, especially children, are by nature intending to be honest. They had no instruction to speak of in this problem of the building of character. For some reason, probably intentional, the development of integrity is not taught. It is something that that we feel should not be taught because it would interfere with the individual's accumulation of worldly goods. I remember when here in Los Angeles we had on the Board of Education a very dynamic lady who was determined to do something about getting some integrities into the public school system. She realized that it wasn't possible to, you know, go religious or to teach creeds of something but she suggested and recommended to the school board that it select, or have someone select for it, a series of brief quotations, one line or two lines at most, from all of the outstanding leaders of world thought, the great scholars, scientists, philosophers, religionists, everyone from all walks, a strong moral statement of an idealistic nature that would be read each morning by the teacher at the beginning of the school day. This was to be either written on the blackboard or simply spoken. And it was there be no definition involving a creedal uh, selectivity. It might be one day from Einstein and might be the next day from Victor Hugo. But it would be a statement of integrities, useful from a, from a celebrated person. The woman had hardly got the, uh, the idea out of her mouth before an adamant lady in the back seat got up. And she said, I don't want anything like that to happen. She said, if you do things like that and you teach my boy to be honest, he'll be a failure. <laughs> this is the way the approach has been. We are afraid that ideals will damage our economic status. We believe that it is more important to keep the individual competitive, make him believe that he has got to cheat his way to the top, than it is for him to have the type of instruction that would make him a good citizen, a good husband, a good son, or a good father. These problems we are afraid of. So in these fears we are also building up toward this final showdown which has to come in every life. Now this showdown does not mean the end of the world. This showdown, uh, showdown does not mean that the planet will slip out of orbit and disappear. It simply means that a way of life will fail. Many ways of life have failed already. There is an ancient Hindu statement that says the great mother, the earth, has shaken countless civilizations from her back. How many we do not even know. We have buried in the dust of time many cultures that at one time believed themselves to be indestructible. The Roman Empire did not believe that Rome could ever fall. Egypt could not imagine a time 
when the great monuments of Egypt would be in rotting dust or in bars swallowed up by the desert. It was impossible that these glories would pass, but they all passed because they had not built into themselves the permanences of integrity. They passed because they did not deserve to live. And any civilization that breaks the rules must either correct its mistakes or join those that sleep in the dust. There is no possible way of corruption winning. There is no possible way of avoiding the final showdown in which the infirmities of a situation come face to face with the surviving power of that situation. And if the infirmities are too great and the surviving power is too weak, another civilization simply fades away. That doesn't mean that humanity ceases. It doesn't mean that there's a great failure. It simply means that a great lesson has been required and that that lesson has been meted out that there is no question whatever as to what the facts are. And then on these facts we can build. Nature has given to each one of us the power to change, the power to do those things which are necessary. It has given us the skills and the wisdom to develop better ways of life. And we have used too many of them to exploit each other. Thus we come finally to the Armageddon. We come finally in every walk of life to that time in which we must stand up and be counted. We are either going with the truth or against it. And there is no middle ground, no compromise possible. And there is no procrastination that will solve anything. It is up to us uh, to make within ourselves a whole series of little Armageddons in which we have fought out our own mistakes one by one and won the fight little by little gaining control of the weaknesses and delinquencies of our own mental and emotional compositions and finally facing into the problem of the world. And if enough of us have defeated ignorance in ourselves, if we have gained the strength to stand with principles, if enough accomplish this, the Armageddon will be solved and the powers of light will be the, the winners. And if they are the winners, then there will be this new heaven and the new earth, which is based upon the virtues of enlightened human beings uniting to protect the society which they wish to preserve. There is no reason why we shouldn't live in a beautiful garden. There is no reason why the best land on earth should be given over to battlefields. These things represent not humanity, but the lack of it. They would come not because we are brighter and stronger and more intelligent and more resourceful, but because we are very foolish and selfish and self-centered and self-destroying. So it starts with us. We can do what we please about it. But if we do what is right, we become part of the army of light that is going to defend principles. If we compromise, we will be part of the army of darkness. And the battle of light and darkness, of truth and error, of wisdom and ignorance, of virtue and vice, this conflict goes on and on until in the long run, regardless of anything we attempt to avoid, in the long run each of us must win. But we make a terrible fight out of it. We have many miseries we do not need. We have many tragedies we could avoid. We have many disappointments that are unnecessary. And right now, I think it's very important to be, think about some of these things because of the condition of the world in which we live. We are beginning to see clearly that the old way of things that has given us nearly 8,000 wars is not going to give us peace. The only war that can end in peace is the war in which we fight only with the weapons of integrity. The only war that can end in peace is the one which virtue wins without force. It is not force that wins, it is integrity. It is not the strength of armament but the strength of character that is the first line of defense. 
And while we have not that line of defense, though the weapons that we have will only be used to kill more of each other. It is integrity that must win, and that, win, that victory will be a victory of peace and not of strife. We will never be able to battle our way to peace. No matter what we do, the battle will only raise up new enemies, new ghosts, lay new foundations for bitterness and hatred, add up to the, complete, the continuous effort of mankind to revenge itself from previous difficulties. All this will go on and on until the, we realize that the great victory is the final victory of peace over selfishness, self-centeredness, and personal ambition. When we are willing to do what is right and do what is necessary, we will have that new kingdom, that new heaven and earth, and we will find that we can live together and build together, and something of the eternal childhood of things will come back. Mencius pointed out that the most important thing in the world is the child spirit, and that when the individual gets rid of the child spirit in the process of growing up, he becomes a disillusioned fool. Because the child spirit that sees beauty in everything and finds gnomes, gnomes under toadstools is the spirit which can bring a new birth. And uh, actually, perhaps in the millennium, if it comes, we will all be, uh, be children again. Children loving and living in a world of brightness and of joy and of friendship. It, it were children with an infinite believing. And also these children in families whose own life is such that we can infinitely believe in them. That there will be no more conflicts, no more stupidity, no more foolishness. And that the way of life as we know it will go and we will find a childhood that is very beautiful. The childhood of everything being fresh and filled with hope because we are not the ones who are constantly killing hope. We cannot kill hope and faith and love and have a good world. But if we take care of those things in ourselves, the world will take care of itself and will rejoice exceedingly and we will have a better destiny than we have ever known or perhaps ever dared to hope for. Most of it simply rests with us and we're going to have to make these decisions out of our own insights. Well, I guess that's it, folks. And uh, I'd like to make an announcement at this time. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I want to announce that Dr. Viola Pettit Neal passed on last Friday afternoon in Arizona. And if you are interested in further information, if you're friends of hers, are interested in further information on this subject, you may discuss it with Irene Bird in our upstairs lecture room uh, after the present talk. And thank you very much for being with us this morning.